poor night for Labour, but Corbyn vows to fight on. Losses were limited in England and hushed some of his critics, but it prompted a stark admission. We hung on and we grew support in a lot of places. Scotland was a catastrophe. Labour came third behind the Conservatives and the triumphant SNP. The result of the election was emphatic. The people of Scotland once again placed their trust in the SNP to govern. Also tonight, a major U-turn on education. Only failing schools will be forced to become academies. The Canadian fires burn on as thousands more are evacuated and... North Korea's reclusive leader goes public on his nuclear threat to the West. This is the ITV Evening News with Alistair Stewart and Charlene White. Good evening. We hung on. The Labour leader's candid admission after a bruising campaign that saw him attacked by friend and foe alike. Few are calling tonight for his scalp, despite the humiliation of coming third to the Tories in Scotland and scoring the worst performance of any new party leader in living memory. In England, Labour lost some seats, but the Conservatives actually lost more. In Scotland, the SNP are the dominant party again, but there was a resurgence from the Tories. In Wales, Labour survived and UKIP gained its first seats. And counting has now finished in the London mayoral elections, where Labour's Sadiq Khan appears to be in the lead. Official confirmation is expected soon. We'll have more on that in just a moment. But first, our deputy political editor, Chris Shipp, on the winners and losers. Where do you send Jeremy Corbyn on a day when Labour has been humiliated in Scotland and gone backwards in England? The answer is one of two by-elections in safe Labour seats which Labour safely held last night. And so it was in Sheffield to cheers, locally at least, that Jeremy Corbyn acknowledged what had happened north of the border. We're going to walk hand in hand with the party in Scotland to build that support once again so that the Labour tradition in Scotland will be re-established once again. I'm sure I can send a message on behalf of everybody here to our colleagues in Scotland. We are with you. What had happened north of the border was both predictable and shocking. The prediction was correctly an SNP win. The result of the election was emphatic. The people of Scotland once again placed their trust in the SNP to govern. The shock, however, was both Labour finishing third and the Conservatives coming second. Their leader here, Ruth Davidson, along with much of Scotland, must have wondered many times if a result like this would ever be possible. So how did Labour under Jeremy Corbyn fare in England? Actually a lot better than many had feared. This is Southampton and this Crawley. Places they could have lost but didn't. However, across England Labour did go backwards. While some had predicted 150 seat losses, last night Labour lost only 25. The Tories actually lost more. There was a glimmer of recovery for the Lib Dems and a modest surge for UKIP. And some Labour MPs this morning blamed the result on the leader. I think there is a problem with our leadership in that we've been distracted, we've been talking about the wrong issues, voters on the doorstep have been saying that to me for, for weeks. So he has to take responsibility for, for what was a disappointing night for the Labour Party. If he chooses to continue on a losing path, and that's what we saw yesterday, holding on to seats and hanging on is not good enough, that, that is not winning. But it means an imminent leadership challenge is off and Labour's top team fills in Boldened. For those begrudgers, because that's what they are, for goodness sake, look, get behind the leader of the Labour Party that was democratically elected. It's time to put up or shut up. Really? In Wales, there was little change. Labour down a fraction, but still in charge in Cardiff. The bigger story was seven new members of the Welsh Assembly for UKIP, one of them being the colourful and controversial former MP Neil Hamilton. As for David Cameron, he didn't have any new Conservative councils to go to today, but his party did get overall control in Peterborough, and that was where he went to give his reaction. Now, local election day for sitting Prime Ministers is meant to be a day of dread. It's meant to be a day when you're 
sitting there waiting for someone to knock on the door like the condemned man waiting uh, for the hangman. But that wasn't what it was like last night or wasn't what it was like today. But the Conservatives are dreading the knock on the door in London where the focus of attention turns tonight. It seems Labour will wrestle control of the mayoralty with Sadiq Khan after eight years of Tory control under Boris Johnson. Jeremy Corbyn will be there to bask in the glory Although there are reports Mr Khan isn't too keen on sharing the stage with his leader. We've had some great results, thank you. Even in victory, Labour's internal problems are clear. Chris Shipp, ITV News. We haven't had the results. Well, in Scotland, Labour suffered its worst set of election results for more than 100 years. The SNP are again the largest party, but were just shy of an overall majority, which crucially could stop them staging a second independence referendum. That's because the Scottish Conservatives made big gains, jumping into second place with 31 seats. And that pushed Labour into third with 24 seats. Our correspondent Martin Geisler reports from Scotland on what's behind the shift. It's a long time since anyone's used the words great night for the Scottish Conservatives, but they're seeing it today. The party's young leader all smiles, and no wonder. Slowly but surely, Ruth Davidson is detoxifying the Conservative brand here. Last night, her party cut the SNP's power at Holyrood, and she claims thwarted Nicola Sturgeon's ambitions for a second independence referendum. If it comes to pass that she wants to push forward with this, uh, and I would suggest that she doesn't and acts in the, the best interests of all of Scotland, not just in the interests of the SNP, my clear uh, recommendation and advice to the Prime Minister is to have no truck with it whatsoever. So you've killed it. This result has killed it last night then, has it? Uh, I think the Scottish Government would do well to take it off the table. The Conservatives know they had help last night from unlikely sources. People who may never have voted Tory before may not even like a great many of their policies. Last night's result is an illustration of how much has changed in Scotland. Politics here isn't so much about left and right anymore. It's seen largely through the prism of independence. Half of the country don't like what the SNP stands for, and it would appear they believe the Tories will do a better job of fighting them than Labour. These are lonely days for Scottish Labour's young leader. Her party was demolished last night, left now with only its isolation to build on. The Labour Party now stands as the strongest left of centre force in Scottish politics. The, the SNP returned with no majority, but sitting in the centre ground of Scottish politics. You can't spin this, the, as, a, can't spin this as a good night for the Labour Party. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting to you is that we now have a government in Scotland that has the same tax policy as the Tories. That doesn't seem to matter so much anymore. There was no earthquake here last night, but the plates are shifting. Many Scots now favour a strong Tory leader over a weak Labour Party. She's very strong and I like her, some of her policies and I think she'll stand up to Nicola Sturgeon. Labour, you, didn't, you don't know where they stand on independence or, or the union. So you know, if people want to vote for the union, that was the obvious party to vote for. There was a definite sense of springtime around Holyrood today. New beginnings, fresh enthusiasm and a whole new team in the game. Martin Geisler, ITV News, Edinburgh. Labour's losses were at their lowest in Wales, where the main story of the night was the growth of UKIP. It gained seven seats. Previously, it had none. Labour has 29 seats. That's down just one. Plaid gained one. The party was hoping for more. The Conservatives were third with 11, just ahead of UKIP, now the fourth biggest party. Our Wales correspondent Rupert Evelyn is in Cardiff for us tonight. So are you seeing this as a major breakthrough for UKIP, Rupert? I think it is. You know, there are some things that Wales probably thought it would never see in its politics, and uh, one of those is UKIP. But that is the system that proportional representation uh, throws up. And we had the slightly peculiar sight just uh, half an hour ago of the First Minister of Wales uh, effectively welcoming Neil Hamilton uh, of UKIP, Labour UKIP politicians, uh, to the Welsh Assembly. I think it's been a good night, certainly for Labour, who didn't get the losses they were expecting. And for Neil Hamilton, well, he hadn't quite worked on his uh, life panning out this way. I hadn't anticipated at the age of 67 that I would once again be elected to public office, uh, particularly after I had been liberated from it so spectacularly in 1997 by the electorate. But uh, I came back into politics after that event for one thing and one thing only, 
to free our country from the bonds of the European Union, which I've been fighting against ever since I joined the Anti-Common Market League in 1967. Now, perhaps one of the big shocks of the night was the uh, Plaid Cymru leader, Leanne Wood, taking a seat off Labour. Now, clearly, Plaid are very keen to make an awful lot of noise about that, but the reality is they simply did not do as well as they would have hoped. Uh, the other surprise this afternoon uh, is that uh, Kirsty Williams, the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, uh, has resigned from her position. Rupert, thank you. Just over a fifth of seats have been declared in the Northern Ireland Assembly elections. First Minister and DUP leader Arlene Foster is among those who've been re-elected. Counts are still going on with some results not expected to be declared until tomorrow. All counts are finished in the London mayoral elections, but the official result is still to come. The results in so far show that Labour's Sadiq Khan is in the lead. Our political correspondent, Romilly Weeks, is live at London's City Hall. So it looks like it's going to be some good news for Labour. Certainly, London was a must-win for Labour. Sadiq Khan said he was nervous as he arrived here at City Hall, but he's been ahead throughout the campaign. He's been ahead here throughout the day as the votes have been counted. And, in fact, the latest results, with 90% of first preference votes verified, is that Sadiq Khan is on 44%, with his Tory rival, Zach Goldsmith, on 35%. So... Within a few hours, barring any last-minute upset, all this will be Sadiq Khan, son of a London bus driver's new domain. What's interesting is what this means for Jeremy Corbyn. He can't claim much credit. Sadiq Khan did his best to keep clear blue water between himself and the Labour leadership. Mr Corbyn's not even expected at the declaration here tonight. There'll be no jubilant photo op of them together. So although this will be an important win for Labour, it's not one that brings the party much closer together. Romilly, thank you. Well, let's get a final word from our deputy political editor, Chris Shipp. Chris, in your view, who will be most pleased with this set of results? Uh, well, I think that's a good question. It really depends on uh, which perspective you look at it from. If you talk to those around uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, his team, they say, look, everyone was telling us before these elections we'd lose 150 seats, perhaps dozens of councils. In the end, we only lost around 25 seats uh, and just one council. And they now talk about a long, slow period of recovery up until the general election in 2020. However, in Labour, Jeremy Corbyn's opponents say, look, we're the opposition up against a divided Conservative Party and we went backwards. Not since 1985 has an opposition party done that. And that shows that Jeremy Corbyn hasn't connected. Now, if you look at David Cameron, he was never really focused on these elections, let's be frank. He's got a much bigger problem, the EU referendum, much more dangerous from him. Yes, he was crowing about Scotland today, but let's be clear, he only won it because they kept him away uh, from Scotland. And whereas London, uh, Labour look like they're going to win, I think because of uh, the London mayoralty and because of those contained losses, I think Jeremy Corbyn is safe, at least for another year. OK, Chris, thank you. Still to come on the ITV Evening News, a climb down over education policy. Plans to force all English schools to become academies are dropped. And inside North Korea, as the secretive state holds a rare party congress. No stories and more after the break. Welcome back. The government made a major U-turn this afternoon on its flagship policy to force all schools in England to become academies. The controversial proposal, which was first announced in March, provoked a furious backlash from Labour and, perhaps more importantly, many Tory MPs. Our political correspondent Carl Dinan reports. This afternoon, just around home time, the government suddenly revealed that it was packing up a key element of its education policy and putting it back in the cupboard. They will not now force all schools in England to become academies. We think that becoming academies is the right way for schools to build a strong future. We want schools to do that by 2022. But we understand that uh, where uh, schools are good or outstanding, where they are supported by a strong local authority, then they want to have the freedom to make the choice to become academy at a time and in a way that is right for them. 
As screeching U-turns go, it was a big one. Parents and teachers opposed to the forced academisation programme are delighted. It was a silly idea that wasn't thought out. No one had uh, spoken to the schools uh, again. Um, a, a silly idea that basically has been shown for what it is and I'm glad it's gone. Academies are independent of local authority control and directly funded from central government. Already 61% of secondary schools and 15% of primaries are academies, but not everyone likes the sound of them. The lack of accountability uh, in the academy structures, the lack of financial scrutiny which is now really coming to the surface, the fact that despite the government saying that schools have more freedom as academies, as far as I can see, if you're part of a chain, you are accountable to the chief executive, so you have actually far less freedom. This U-turn isn't just damaging for the Education Secretary, Nicky Morgan. The policy of making every school become an academy was announced by the Chancellor himself. I am today providing extra funding so that by 2020, every primary and secondary school in England will be, will be in the process of becoming an academy. Now, underperforming schools will still be forced to become academies, as will schools under local authorities, which are performing poorly. But not all schools, and that is an embarrassment for the government. As is another U-turn, but why today? Well, that's an interesting question. There is, let's say, considerable suspicion that the government chose to make this embarrassing announcement on the day when all those interesting elections were dominating the headlines. The government say, no, no, nothing to see here. This was the first day after the restrictions of the election period that we could have said this. The other question, of course, is why they're doing it. That one is easier to answer. Lots of Tory backbenchers hated it. The government has a small majority and they might not have won a vote on it. All right. Carl, thank you. A convoy of stranded residents are having to drive back through a fire-ravaged Canadian city to escape to safety. The group has been trapped in the north of Fort McMurray as the wildfire spread further. So far, hundreds of homes, businesses and cars have been destroyed. Paul Davis has the latest. The fire chief has called it the worst week of his career. Today, his men were able to enter the suburbs they were unable to save. Crazy. The whole neighbourhood just lost last night. Seen from one of the emergency vehicles, what used to be a housing estate before the fire claimed it. I still feel the heat off these uh, houses and stuff. Just Hundreds of vehicles were also consumed by the flames, abandoned when the only roads out of Fort McMurray became jammed with thousands of people running for their lives. Many of those residents are in evacuation centres now. The order to abandon their homes apparently vindicated as no lives were lost despite the devastation. These images, understood to have been taken by a security camera, show just how quickly one house in Fort McMurray is filled with flames and smoke and then destroyed. The all-devouring wildfires are now switching direction, heading south away from the city. It means thousands of residents who fled north may be able to return in a giant convoy that will be escorted past what's left of their homes and onto cities that are offering them temporary shelter. Paul Davis, ITV News. The United Nations says the airstrike on a refugee camp in Syria that killed at least 28 people could amount to a war crime. Officials will begin an investigation into the attack near the town of Samada on the Turkish border, which came a day after the extension of a truce had been confirmed. Syria's military has denied any involvement. Here a man has been arrested on suspicion of murder and attempted murder after a double shooting at a caravan site in Somerset. Charlie Broadway handed himself in to officers this afternoon. North Korea's supreme leader, Kim Jong-un, today hailed his country's great success in recent nuclear tests. He was addressing thousands of loyal delegates in a showpiece party conference. Even the spontaneous applause appeared perfectly orchestrated. And as our correspondent Debbie Edward reports from Pyongyang, the international media was kept well away. They cheer for a leader who today hailed an H-bomb test as his greatest achievement in office. 
Kim Jong-un, opening the first Workers' Party Congress in 36 years, with a speech celebrating the unprecedented results of his nuclear weapons program. The 33-year-old was clearly seeking to send a strong message to the world leaders who have condemned his actions. But we, together with over a hundred foreign journalists invited here to report on the event, were not allowed in. The Congress is taking place in the building behind me, which commemorates the foundation of the Korean army. A fitting place then for Kim Jong-un to assert his control over the military and his party. The people of Pyongyang feel a great sense of occasion. The student believes it will show North Korea is a thriving nation. A slap in the face for America, he says. <laughs> Grandfather Kim Song-ho said that by holding Kim Jong-un in high esteem, his grandson will have a brighter future. <laughs> Kim ok yu is a doctor in the city <laughs> and told us she has pride in a nation that can defend itself against any enemy in the world. What this Congress will likely lack in policy making, it will make up for in political showmanship. Debbie Edward, ITV News, Pyongyang. And finally tonight, to the disappointment of many, Britain's new polar research ship is to be called Sir David Attenborough and not Boaty McBoatface. That's despite more than 100,000 people voting for it to be given the silly name. The science minister decided it wasn't really fitting for one of the <laughs> world's most advanced research ships. However, Boaty McBoatface does live on. It will be the name of one of the submarines on board the vessel. Perhaps that should be Subby. McSubface. Oh, no, no. I... All right, I apologise. <laughs> OK, that's all for now. Tom Bradley will be here with News at 10. But from all of the team here, have a very good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye.